recording now. All right, Dr. Ross, it is a pleasure to be interviewing today, and thank you for your time. Sure. So, um, first of all, I just want to ask you about some general information about you, like um, just your whole career path and your education and um, how you got to where you are now. Okay. Well, again, you can edit a lot of this if it's too much, but <laughs> okay. I started out at, um, in, 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 well, freshman year in college. I went to the University of Memphis, it, now it was Memphis State University, and I wanted to be a, a physical education teacher. <clears throat> my brother, my, my brothers were, were athletes, uh, all-American athletes. I have two older brothers, and so I, I was always involved in sports. And so I started in my freshman year, I worked at a playground in Memphis. Memphis had 125 playgrounds for kids all over the city, and there was always a male and a female, uh, director, assistant director, and then um, uh, mostly college students. And so I started off, my grandfather knew the executive director of the Memphis Park Commission, so he got me a job, and, and my first job was at the worst playground in the city of Memphis in terms of violence and drugs and everything you could think of that was going on. But I, I, I stayed there and liked it, and I liked, enjoyed it. It was working with kids, um, and the only thing that really related to them was sports, being able to play tennis or basketball or, or tetherball or box hockey, whatever it is. They liked the sports. I liked the sports, and so I could relate. The kids could, uh, were just a different, totally different background than what I was from, a, a very rough, rough area. Uh, switchblades in the back pockets, you know, you're talking kids five years old to probably 16, all juvenile delinquents, parents, single parents, one parent was usually in state prison. Uh, it's just a tough group, and so, but I liked it, and I really enjoyed it. First first year, uh, first week in that summer, uh, my assistant director was a, uh, a, a nice young lady, and I went to lunch first week, came back, and these guys had taken her and had raped her on the playground, and so, you know, she, she quit, and I was by myself for May, June, and July, and then first week in August. And so, by myself, doing this, it's a tough job. Uh, so, managed sophomore year, physical education, wanted to be a coach, wanted to be a physical education teacher, worked in the summer to make some money, went applied for the park commission, said, you know, I'd like to have a, a job, different playground, scheduled, same playground. Same identical playground, same kids. Another young lady, she stayed about, oh, a day, and too rough, quit. And so I was there the second summer by myself, liked it, worked with the kids. Third year, I was the uh, same thing, same playground. Uh, then fourth year, my senior year, they put me on the same playground again. So I had four years at that at that playground. Um, Eye-opening experience, really loved what I was doing, working with kids in a recreational environment, but I was getting a degree in physical education to be a coach and, uh, a coach and physical education teacher. So I graduated Memphis State, <coughs> I ended up doing my student teaching, um, similar to what you guys want to do with your internship. Uh, I was assigned the worst junior high school in the city of Memphis. Um, it, all African American school, I was the only Caucasian at the school. Uh, kids were, were tough, it, just, it was a tough environment. Uh, my supervising teacher, first week was a coach and a history teacher and I was in his history class in the back of the room observing, that was my minor. And bell rang, we went to, to lunch, came back and the coach wasn't there. What happened, the coach had raped a girl after class uh, in the classroom. And so he was fired uh, on the spot. And so I was by myself. My supervisor said, you have a choice. You can either uh, we'll put you in another school, but we're, we're gonna run out. Of, we don't have time to do that. You have to wait another semester, or you can stay here by yourself. And so I had just got married at 21 and couldn't wait another semester, so I did it. And so I was there by myself as a, as a student teacher, coach, physical education teacher, tough environment. Sports, liked it, and could, could, could relate well to them. And so that so kind of gives you a little bit of background. Uh, I did graduate. Uh, I did get a job teaching and uh, coaching uh, in a small school system in Missouri uh, when I left there. Uh, 
girls, athletic director, girls sports, outstanding girls. They were farm girls, never played sports. Back then they didn't have girls sports. It was just starting to evolve. Uh, great group of girls, freshmen, outstanding athletes, um, just didn't know the game, didn't know how to play structured ball, but I was asked to be the coach and girls were outstanding. And so we went and won the, the sectional, the regional, went to the state in softball, first time this little town had ever gone to the state. Uh, girls lost, but they, these girls had never even stayed in a hotel before. They had never gone out in their little community of 700 people. Played basketball, same girls, outstanding, uh, uh, one section, one regional, went to the state, lost in the state, but those girls were just outstanding. Bob Knight had just, was was big time in 76, if you remember when IU won, uh, 76, I wanted to be a Bobby Knight. That's who I modeled myself after, my coaching, I was able to do the same things that he was doing with, with the, the, the boys basketball here, I was able to do with those girls, and it was just really <coughs> fun. But, but sitting there in the gym watching this, I noticed that, that I'm dealing with the elite kids. And what happened to all those recreation kids? So I quit. Uproar in the town while I was a coach quitting. He had freshmen, he going to be state the next three years with these girls. Why would you do that? Because I wanted to come back and work with kids. So I chose Indiana University. It was the number one school in the country in terms of recreational sport, recreation. And so I came here to get my doctorate. Uh, in recreation and teach people how to do what I was, what I had been doing. Got here, I uh, got into the summer program in 77, sitting next to a fellow in class and he said, uh, do you know how to schedule a tournament? I said, yeah, I do. He said, well, they just lost the intramural uh, associate director who's in charge of all the intramural sports. He just quit. Uh, why don't you go talk to the director? You might be able to get on as a graduate student working with that. So I went up there, was hired uh, in 78 and started and worked 78, 79, 80, uh, graduated with my doctorate in 80, and had the, just a lifetime experience working with intramural sports from those three years. In charge of a, one of the largest intramural programs in the country. Uh, 500 basketball teams, 450 volleyball, 400 soccer. Uh, I mean, just a huge program. About 250 uh, officials, student officials, about 50 supervisors. Um, j just a huge program. I never worked with Greek system, had to learn the, the Greek <laughs> letters. Uh, all that stuff was new to me. I never played intramurals at Memphis State. Um, and so I, I um, uh, it, it was just a lot of fun working a lot of hours, worked 70 hours a week, uh, but just really enjoyed it while I was going through my, through my, my doctoral program. Uh, and I also got my master's degree at Memphis State when I was there, a bachelor's and a master's. Um, so I, I graduated in 80, wasn't going to be a teacher. I was going to be a, a, a high, higher education teacher. Left there, left IU here, went down and got a job at the University of Southern Mississippi, was teaching in recreation, and got there about a month into it. I said, hmm, this is not what I really wanted to do compared to IU. The boss here at IU and Rec Sports said, we'd like to have you back. The person that we hired was not what we thought, and we would like to have you back. I said, sure. So I came back in nine months in 81 and was um, hired as associate director uh, and there was of intramural sports, and there was associate director for informal club and aquatics and those things, and then there was the director. And so I worked there till 93 uh, as associate director, and then in 93, a full-time position in academics and recreation for a professor in rec sports. And so I took it, and so I've been there since 91, 2014. So how many years that is? 23 years in academics. So that's my background. I wanted to be a PE teacher and a coach. <laughs> Did it for a little bit. Ended up in recreational sports. Loved it because you work with all kinds of people, regardless of their skill ability, uh, and have been doing that for the last 37 years or so, 36 years. Wow. That's a little bit, and as I was mentioned earlier, uh, we'll be retiring on, in, in May 31st um, of, um, of this year, so maybe 30, 36 years here at IU, plus my time in Memphis and coaching in Missouri, so it'll be about 40, 41 years in the field. Wow. All right, and um, so we want to talk more specifically about um, the organization you ran here at IU. Okay. Back in the early 80s. So let's do the intramurals. Intramurals. And rec sports, okay. Yeah, and just some, um, you know, tell us about 
some of the demographics of the people you're trying to cater towards with the intramurals and okay. um, possibly, you know, some of the financial things behind it, the budgeting, and maybe even, especially on back then, just what kind of technology you were able to work with and maybe tell me a little bit about how technology now has sure. changed the field. Good questions. Um, the, the demographics of the population, well, it's students, and so which is what I love. And so there's 40,000 students here on campus, 42,000. Back then there was in the, in the mid-30s. And so it's, it's students working with students and having an opportunity to work with thousands of students uh, as players. And so with, with the basketball, let's just say it's basketball, 500 teams, 10 on a team, that's 5,000 students that I impacted with my ability to schedule tournaments and run tournaments and schedule officials and make sure the games are run properly. So I impacted 5,000 people just in that sport. Uh, but then there was also another component that in an intramural program, not just at IU but all over the country, we work with student leaders. And so there are uh, fraternity managers and sorority managers and off-campus managers. There are, are uh, head officials and lead of student I mean, these are your, the leadership part of it. And so to work with those student leaders, thousands of them over the, the, the 16 years out there, that was extremely uh, fun and gratifying to work with some students who really, really got into this. It was all voluntary, but they just love playing recreational sports. So remember what recreational sport is, going back to a, a semester or two ago. Recreational sports deals with the, the, the non-varsity, the non-professional athlete. It's the average person. Regardless of their of their physical ability, their sport ability, their size, their height, their, their weight, their gender, uh, it doesn't make any difference as long as you have an interest and want to play. You may not be the greatest. Uh, you could not play for maybe for an IU varsity team, but you may have been a great high school athlete but just chose to come to IU and get a degree but not play varsity sports. And so, you know, we have 900 varsity athletes in, the, in, in, in athletics and you got 40,000 students. So there's 39,100 students who still like basketball and football and volleyball, but they can't play varsity. And so who works with the, who makes sure they have facilities and programs and equipment and good, good games and official, who does that? Well, that's what I did. And so to be able to impact all those students who would still love to play sports, but just didn't want to go to that next level. So that's the demographics, the play, uh, working with all those uh, different, different groups. Uh, in terms of budget, uh, this program uh, at, a, at a university is not designed to make money, it's to break even and to generate you know, some money so you can repairs on buildings and so forth. But um, it's a student activities fee. So each one of you pay a student activity fee um, in, in your tuition. And whether you know that or not, you have to have a technology fee and there's a student. Fee. Whether you use facilities or not, so some, a small portion of that goes to this program and helps offset the cost. So we can charge entry fees of, of lower, $25, or back then it was like $5 just to play. Uh, so you didn't have to charge $200, $300 for a team, but students didn't have the money to do that. And so that helped offset the cost of the officiating and the facilities and equipment and those kinds of things. Uh, so, you know, the student activity fee fee was really, was really helpful in terms of budgeting. In terms of technology, there was no technology when I started. They didn't, you know, they, they didn't have that. We did everything with pencil and a typewriter, an electric typewriter with the corrector tape that you put back in there if you made mistakes. And so that's how we, skip, we, we typed up tournaments. At huge you know, 500 teams, you all have team and so secretary and myself and staff and we were typing and scheduling by the, 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 old, the old way. Um, did that for a number of years, happened to run into an, a graduate student that liked technology back in the 90s and computers were just getting started. Remember the PC just started in 95, so about 89, 90. This person was advanced and he liked tournaments, he liked sports and so he came to me and said, I can put together this this program that maybe helped schedule it. It was all cryptic. I mean, it was just, but it was pretty good at the time. And so we started. I remember the, my boss telling me, we've done tournament scheduling by hand for years and years and years, and it worked good. If you want to go technology with this thing, I'm just telling you, if there are mistakes with, with scheduling, you're going to lose your job. 
So do you still want to do it? I said, absolutely, we got to do this. This is crazy. And so we did it and, it, and it worked fine, and it really advanced us. And we were the first universities in the country that were doing computerized tournament scheduling uh, with this individual that I had. And so that started us, and then we've always been involved in technology since that day, and I was kind of put in charge of the technology when I was there. And uh, we, I mean, you look at today, Rec Sports today in 2014, what they have, and light years, light years yeah. difference in terms of what we were doing and what they're, what they currently do now. They, they really have embraced technology in that. So technology has has changed uh, tremendously. Budget hasn't changed, uh, has increased as well. I, I was on the design team and back in those years. We had Wildermuth. We had the Hyperbuilder. That's all we had. And so I was fortunate enough that one of my jobs uh, was working with the director and myself and two architects from uh, IU campus, two architects from Indianapolis, and two architects from a New Jersey firm. We, we designed the SRSC. And so it was a vacant piece of uh, land. And this team of us were able to put, put together the SRSC, what you, what you now are, are using. So that was, back then that was new. I mean, it was huge. It was going to get students, had to pay for it, and we took us eight years to convince the students from 82 to 90 to pay for this building, that you needed it, we had to have it on this campus, and they finally, this, the, the, the student IUSA president finally endorsed it in 90, and we got the money. And so, uh, the director and myself, when you look at the facility, the rooms, the weight room, the fitness area, those are the things that we designed. And then uh, uh, the architect team put in all the cutesy things, but that was fun. I mean, I'd never done that before. Uh, learned a lot, made some mistakes, made some pretty good decisions, um, but that was a huge undertaking. And nowadays, what is that was done? And it was um, it was started. It was groundbreaking. Was ninety three. It was finished in ninety five, and that was the new facility. So ninety five was that now almost twenty years old. That building is now almost twenty years old. But I was one of the founding architects of that building. So that that was fun. That was exciting to do that. Okay. Um. Well, we're running a little short on time, unfortunately. But that's all right. And um. I guess could you just tell me any suggestions for? future employees in the recreation field and, um, you know, just well, the path they should possibly take or, you know. I think that the, the, the advice that I would give, I gave, give classes and I had met a young lady yesterday, she had the same kind of question. My advice over the, the 40 plus years of working is simple, very simple advice, is be passionate. When you go for an interview, you've got to be passionate about what you want to do. That I'm excited. This is what I want to do. This is the greatest thing. I'm so I can't wait to get involved and and and, and so engaged in it. And you would be amazed at the students or employees that I've hired over the year. When you when you interview them, there's no there's no smile. There's no expression. There's no life. It's just that I I'm an, I have a degree. I'm entitled to a job, and you should hire me. And they, you know, you have to realize that you're competing with thousands of graduates across the country who all have that degree and all those skills, but it's the personality, it's the drive, it's the passion, it's the smile, it's the seeing you and you light up when you talk about this, this subject, whether it's sports communication or recreational sports, whatever, that's what's going to get you the job. So you, you know, and it's, it's, it's something that a teacher can't teach it. It has to come from you that this is what I, this is what I want to do. I'm so excited about doing this. And it shows in an interview, and you're going to rise to the top. All right. I awesome. think that is about it oh, for us. We're right out of time. Dr. Ross, no problem. we are at 19 minutes flat. Well, and I'm going to stop this now. Uh, and in almost all, all the things we do in recreation, you're talking about a vertical, the tall. So a tall surgery. The, the, uh, so you have a director, two associates, four assistants, bunch of coordinators. So it's that it's that tall, that vertical organization. Uh, you don't see very many horizontal or, or flat uh, in, in our field. Some small agencies that, you know, some of our students do graduate and go into uh, a little small parks and recreation department, county parks, where have two people. There's a director and assistant director and they do all of stuff in, in sports and cultural things and everything. That's a flat. And so you have just a few people and it's just flat line. 
in, in what we do in a college, university, or in a, any kind of sport, it's going to be that vertical. You're going to have director, associate, assistant, coordinator. Yeah. Good answer. Thank you. The, the, the well, it's real party more, but in terms of goals in the, in the faculty. Um, yeah, you mentioned you're retiring. Do you have any hopes that you, you know, you I, I, for this place? I'd be honest, I mean, I, and it doesn't bother me if you say this or not, but we're one of the only schools, or well, I should say, maybe a couple of not very many across the country that have two sport management programs. We have a recreational sport management program and we have a kinesiology sport marketing and management program. There's two programs. You, 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 you deal with the professional side, the entertainment, the business side of sport. We deal with the participatory side, mass participating, get, getting thousands of people to play in. You're involved with Peyton Manning and getting 100 football players in on the on the Broncos or the Colts, right? And you, but your job is to get people into the stands for Earth Day to make money. It's a business. It's an entrepreneurial business thing. We don't care about money. We don't care about those. We care about getting people not in the stands but into the field. Well, so there's two different programs. Most around the country, you'll see it in one. It's one program called sport management or sport administration, whatever you want to call it, and then they have different feeders. If you want to go professional, go this way, you can go record, you can, but there's one program. And that's, I think, what we should have here. We should have one program, because everybody's confused. You, you, you don't know the difference between what I do in recreation and what sport mark, sport communication does in Kinesia. So people, students I have come and say, I, I thought they were the same thing. What, what do you do, what do they do? I'm so confused, I don't know what's going on. And if we have one program, I think it'd be a lot easier for you guys, for the students to understand what my degree is and what what career paths I can go. So let's have a Dr. Sales's course, the two, 210, 220, P211, yeah. whatever 211, that, yeah. but that intro course, yeah, 211. he has 200, 300 students, that's a great course to do an intro and then explain all of the paths, professional, recreation, college, wherever you want to do, but then the students sitting in that class, oh, this is great, I think I want to go pro. I don't want to go to the recreational side, and then they advise you to go into those different tracks. I guess you could call them tracks, and, and that I think would be a lot. Of, that would be my goal if I was staying. That would try to try to get that merged back together, so we have one program like most of the other other programs around the country do. Mm -hmm. But that's an academic that doesn't affect most of the. I think if I was in recreational sports, the campus recreational sports, we need a new facility. That facility, if you, I don't know if you guys use that much, but it's crowded, 20 years old now, and, and so to compete with other uh, universities around the country that they're trying to you know, get students to come, we need a new building. We need a, a third building, or we need a major expansion onto the north side of that other building. We need more parking out there. Uh, th there's just a lot more needs. We just got too many students. You know, you go to Ohio State, they got 50,000 students, but they got five SRCs five buildings on that campus, huge. And we got one, well, one and two, one and a half or two of this building. And so we're just behind, and this needs students going to have degree again. We're willing to pay a more money if you if you'd build it. And so I think I think my goal would be let's get more building space for the students, increase that so you guys have more, more room, more, more facilities. Agreed. Yeah. <laughs>